She's in the house, find her. Posted by He Ha Chauffeur. If you live in Menifee, California, and there is a knock at your door tonight, don't answer it. More importantly, don't leave anyone in the house by themselves. Get your phone, call the police, and stay together. I'm writing this as I'm sitting in this police station questioning room as a warning so that what happened to me last night won't happen to you tonight. I live on my own in suburbia. Nice little neighborhood. The kind of place where kids will be playing out in the street with parents doing yard work when you pull into your driveway. That's exactly how last night began. My girlfriend and I pulled in and got out of the car. We waved to the kids and had a friendly chat with Mrs. Roop next door. This was the kind of life I always imagined. And at 20, I couldn't believe it had already happened for me. We went inside and started our evening. We made dinner. We love cooking together. There's a symmetry between us that just works. We ate, watched some TV downstairs. Just a normal night. Once it was time we went upstairs, she started doing her nightly routine girls always do in the bathroom, and I just laid in bed, reading pen pal for the 20th time. With the fan going and the water running from the bathroom, I almost didn't hear it. I wish now that the fan was set to three instead of two, because then everything would be different. But no, it was just faint enough for me to hear the sound over everything else. Knock, knock, knock. I reached over and clicked the fan off. I waited for a moment listening. Knock, knock, knock. God damn it. I thought. I put my book down on the nightstand and got up. I grabbed my zip up off the chair and threw it on. As I walked out of the room, I could hear my girlfriend starting to say something, but I wanted to get rid of whoever was at the door first. I slumped down the stairs a little pissy, thinking that if this was another solicitor trying to sell me glass cleaner, I was going to have a fit. I zipped up the jacket as I flicked the light on next to the front door. I looked through the peephole, but it was pitch black. I flicked the outside light on. Still pitch black. I figured the light bulb had gone out again, as I have had problems with it before. Reluctantly, I twisted the deadbolt and opened the door. Nothing. No one was there. I poked my head out to look around. The yard and driveway were empty. Looking back, I made so many horrible mistakes. I stepped out onto the welcome mat. The streets were empty and silent, minus the hum from the street lights. I scoffed and figured it was the kids just trying to play a prank. I turned and walked back inside. After relocking the door and heading back for the stairs, I started to have a feeling. Something just didn't feel right in my stomach and I knew that only one thing was going to put it at ease. Food. I walked down the hallway into the kitchen and flicked on the light. Opening up the fridge, I started to scan the shelves for something quick and easy to eat. I settled on one of those wafer peanut butter and chocolate bars that you can get at the dollar stores. I keep them in the fridge so they don't melt in my hand when I'm eating them. I peeled back the plastic wrapper and as I was taking my first bite, I noticed something odd out of the corner of my eye. The window above the kitchen sink was open. I'd never opened that window for the entire time I'd lived here. I thought back trying to remember when it could have happened and then I recalled her saying that she was feeling really hot while she was doing the dishes. She must have opened it to try and cool off. I walked over and slid it shut and finally made my way back upstairs. I walked back into the bedroom and the water was still running. I went to the entrance to the bathroom. Did you say something early dash? I began to stay but stopped. The bathroom was empty. Water continued to pour out of the faucet, steam floating up, clinging to the mirror. I stopped the water and turned around to scan the room. She wasn't there. Amanda, I called out. No answer. I went to the walk-in closet. Nothing. I started to leave the room, but again something catches my eye. I glanced at my nightstand, and on top of my book was a piece of paper. It was folded in half and set up, making it look like a little tent. I reached out and picked it up. 
The first thing I obviously saw was the blood. It was a bloody fingerprint on the corner of the paper. My heart started to race. Finally, my brain let my eyes pan over to read what it said, and even now, I wish it wouldn't have. She's in the house, find her. I read it those six words over and over. I looked around the room again, hoping to see Amanda just hiding in the corner snickering like she'd pulled off an amazing prank. But the room was empty. I walked around the room, looking behind chairs, inside the shower, inside the closet. I looked at the bed and felt like a six-year-old again as I slowly knelt down to look underneath. My hands had apparently been getting sweaty because they kept slipping slightly against the hardwood floor. I bent down and lifted the skirt of the bed. Nothing. Just a couple dust bunnies and an old pair of shoes that I keep meaning to throw out. I stood back up and started to become agitated. My mind didn't know whether this was a joke or if I needed to be terrified. Amanda, I yelled, this isn't funny anymore, now just come out. Silence. Look, I'm really freaked out, so stop this. I walked out into the upstairs hallway and quickly went through all the rooms. The spare bedroom, empty. The exercise room, empty. Other upstairs bathroom, empty. I ran downstairs and looked everywhere there too. It was if she just vanished and all that was left was this note. I figured that the only thing left to do was to call the police. I ran back upstairs and into the bedroom. The bathroom faucet must have had a leak because as I entered, I started hearing faint drips of water. I went to the dresser to grab my phone, but it wasn't there. Neither were my keys or wallet. I spun and looked at my nightstand. They weren't there. I grabbed my jeans I wore that day I was in sweats by now and checked the pockets. Empty. I threw the jeans on the floor in anger. I stood there for a moment without a clue of what I should do. Drip, drip, drip. I stormed into the bathroom and twisted the knob. Drip, drip. I hit the faucet getting pissed, but then I froze. There was no water in the sink and the drips sounded further away. I slowly walked back out into the bedroom. Drip, drip. I moved around trying to determine where it was coming from. As I moved closer to the bed, it got louder. Once again, I slowly dropped to my knees and bent over next to the bed. My hand slowly reached for the bed skirt and lifted it up. For every drip, my heart pounded 50 times. I sank my head down and looked under the bed. And then I saw it a small pool or red about a foot in front of me. With more dripping down from above, I jumped to my feet and pulled the sheets off the bed. I slid my hands in between the mattress and the box spring, and after a moment of hesitation, I flung the mattress up with everything I had. My throat closed instantly. I couldn't comprehend what was in front of me. My mind would only let me process the image one fraction at a time. At first, I just saw my box spring, sitting inside my bed frame. Then I saw that there was a huge tear down the middle of the box spring. And then I saw Amanda, inside the box spring, her beautiful face poking out from the tear. Then there was her neck, which was nothing but red. The final thing that my mind let me see appeared. It was right in the center, laying on her stomach, another note. I couldn't move. Tears were streaming down my face uncontrollably, but I didn't make a sound. My hands began to violently shake and my knees collapsed onto the edge of the box spring. I reached out and pulled Amanda's body up. My girl, my life, my everything. I wrapped my arms around her and started to scream. The note slid off her hitting the box spring. My hand slowly moved down towards the note now barely even able to bend my fingers. I somehow managed to grasp the note and bring it up to my eyes. My vision was completely blurred from the tears. I wiped them against my jacket sleeve and looked at the note. Again, there was a bloody fingerprint, but at this point, it could have been mine. Everything is hazy from those moments. 
But the words, the words are forever burned into my memory. They are the reason I am sitting here now, the reason I ran out of my house screaming for help. But where am I? Something is seriously wrong with my balls. Posted by Mandark. I was jogging down the cobblestone sidewalk outside my house when it all began. A sudden explosion of pain in my groin, like I had been kicked hard in the nuts. I doubled over, the nerves in my jaw twitching as stars turned my vision hazy. What the fuck? Had I stumbled and made my balls knock together somehow? I imagined two glassy marbles swinging through the air and crashing into each other with such force it made them crack open like eggs. I could almost feel the yolk trickling down my thighs. Fuck, that imagery fit perfectly with the agony emanating from my gonads in overwhelming waves. An agony so intense it made me hurl the remnants of last night's dinner all over Mrs. Abernathy's neatly trimmed hedge. I walked back home bow-legged, like a fucked up giant crab. The pain didn't subside, not nearly as soon or as much as I would have wanted. It lingered, throbbing like a pulsating vein, sending shocks of suffering coursing through my body. Ice packs, painkillers, some good old rest, nothing seemed to help. I spent the day covered in sweat, teeth gnashed to the point of breaking. My coworkers thought I was nuts. I didn't know how to tell them that the problem was my fucking nuts. Time flowed slow and thick, like molasses. Each tick of every clock I saw seemed to carry a hint of rust. By the time I came back home from the office, my thighs felt raw, like they'd been chafed with sandpaper till the skin started to peel. It was impossible because I had kept them as far apart as I could without looking like a sex offender. Yet my crotch was damp with sweat. It looked like I had pissed myself. I hadn't. Any attempt to force urine out of my now reddish penis was met with a burning pain. Felt like acid was flooding my urethra. And the worst of all, my balls were starting to swell. When I first spied them in the office washroom, I dismissed the swelling as the natural result of an injury, an injury I thought would heal with time. But when I saw them again back at home, I was forced to stifle a very shrill scream. My little nuts, usually the size of plums, had swollen into oranges. I quickly and gingerly pulled my pants back on. The grotesque bulge in my trousers left me staggering. It looked like I had stuffed tennis balls down my underwear. That's it. Time to go see a fucking doctor. Trouble was, I'm absolutely terrified of doctors. I have nightmares about them. Sadistic bastards with their pristine white lab coats and shining smiles poking and prodding at me. A childhood incident involving a scalpel and a tongue depressor had left me scarred for life. I looked at them all with an unhealthy amount of distrust. I decided against going to the doctor that evening. Maybe just a little more time will do the trick, I reasoned. A good night's rest and I'll be good as new the next morning. What a fucking idiot. I slept on my back that night, or tried to at least. Naked, with my knees raised in the air, like I was about to give birth letting the whirling fan blast cool air down at my crotch. As the throbbing ache in my family jewels continued, I thought about what the fuck had actually happened to me. How did I hurt myself this bad? A small accident involving my nuts rocking against one another? It couldn't get this bad with just that. What then? A pulled muscle? A blown vein? Ridiculous. I shuddered as I remembered all the scary shit I had read about on the internet. Worms and spiders and parasites nesting in odd nooks and crannies in the human body. Dear God, I hoped it wasn't that. Anything but that. If I saw insects crawling out of... Stop that. The night wore on. I sweated, tossed and turned and made the pain flare up even worse, 
got up and waddled around my room before gently slipping back into bed again. I don't think I got a wink of sleep that night. My eyes were bloodshot red and wide open by the time sunlight started streaming through the windows. The muscles in my limbs were stretched tighter than the skin of a bongo drum while my heart pounded like a wild beast in my chest. And my balls. Fuck. My balls. They had swollen further through the night, turning from oranges to big grapefruits to fucking melons. My dick slipped and slid between my gigantic testicles, like a black worm squirming and writhing on a pair of wrinkled breasts. My pubic hair looked like a tiny patch of matted black grass above my scrotum. The flesh around my crotch had reddened, as if the veins in my thighs had vomited out everything within them. Skin peeled off, flaky and ruddy and hot and wet. I had entered the fucking twilight zone. What was happening to me was so far beyond the realm of logic and reason that it made my brain stretch against my skull. Doctor, now. I staggered onto my feet, groaning in pain as my nuts. Can't really call them fucking nuts anymore. My heavy coconuts dangled beneath me, threatening to tear free from my body. Something sloshed in my stomach and I retched, falling backwards onto my bed almost passing out from the pain. Fuck it. Ambulance. I dreaded how much it would cost me, but chose to call for an ambulance anyway. There was no way I was getting to the hospital by myself. No fucking way. My balls would rip free and my guts would slide out of the hole and splatter on the carpeted floor of my car before I could even pull out of my driveway. So I waited. I got dressed, as much as I could anyway, while using a chair as a stool to rest my beach balls. When the ambulance arrived, I crawled backwards over to the front door, whimpering as I dragged my enormous testicles across the hardwood floor. They were even bigger then, so big that the wrinkles had disappeared into the taut skin. I could see black veins scrawled across them like a fucked up spider web. The EMTs screamed when they saw me, I must have looked like a monster out of a Cronenberg movie. Half-naked, wide-eyed, pale as candle wax and covered in sweat with balls big and full like water balloons made out of skin. I don't remember much about the ride to the hospital. I was too delirious for that. Sometimes, though, bits and pieces will flash through my head. Paramedics shouting into the radio, their hands trembling as they fondled my colossal balls with fear and something that almost seemed to approach reverence. Being placed on a gurney, gasps and screams erupting all around us as we rolled into the hospital. The next time I came to, I was in a cold and sterile room, surrounded by doctors and nurses donning green scrubs and protective glasses. A bright light glared down at my crotch, I blinked rapidly, trying to clear the cobwebs clouding my vision. A series of thick tubes ran down from my testicles, pumping out what looked like a disgusting mixture of clotted blood and sticky, viscous pus. Or were they pumping it in? I don't know. Like I said, I was pretty fucking out of it. Mr. Stone? How are you feeling? One of the doctors asked me, his voice almost forcibly calm. I mumbled something. I didn't seem to have full control over my mouth. You are on heavy painkillers, Mr. Stone, which is why you're having some trouble speaking. I nodded, or tried to, I think. You have quite the interesting condition, I must say. Been practicing for 20 years, haven't seen anything like it. He must have seen the look on my face. Oh, don't worry. We'll take care of it. Make some incisions here and there and drained whatever's in these suckers right out. You just relax. Now. He muttered something incomprehensible. What was that? I asked, wrestling with my tongue to slowly force the words out. I said, I am going to cut your fucking balls off, you little bitch. My spine shivered as he spat those words out. What the fuck? 
Was I hallucinating? Then I heard another voice. There seems to be some bone-like formation under the skin, doctor. La 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 la, itty bitty balls. Snip, snip, snip. Bone, within the scrotum? That can't be right. A hollow sound issued, like knocking on a wooden table. My hips shuddered. Hmm, very interesting. We are recording this right. Take the whole fucking thing off. Then a sloshy, squishy sound followed and my esophagus undulated. What is that? Christ, it's glowing. What the fuck? Is that a tent? Those last words were cut off by a hair-raising, eardrum-shattering scream that ripped out of my throat. It felt like a dam had burst within me. All the pain that had been kept at bay by the painkillers stormed through my body. Sensations flooded through my nerves like I had been jolted awake after a decade-long sleep. My groin was on fire. It felt like I was bumping uglies with a furnace. The nerve endings in my crotch seemed to pull and twist and shiver. I screamed. Again. And I wasn't the only one screaming. Every doctor in that room screamed with me, and I soon saw why. My balls were gone. So was my dick. It looked like I had taken a shotgun blast right at my crotch. Just a repulsive mess of bones and blood and rotting flesh and long, curling flaps of skin, all soaked in piss that reeked of the deepest pits of hell. Tears pricked my eyes. It hurt more than it ever had, more than all the times I had blacked out from the pain combined, yet I was wide awake, like something was forcing me into full state of alertness. My heart beat at an unnaturally fast pace, sweat coated my face like a second skin, and my arms hung uselessly by my sides. My eyes darted around, taking in the madness around me. The medical team treating me was killing itself. One doctor cut his throat with a scalpel, another scooped his eyes out with some wicked spoon-looking tool. Another slipped on the blood on the floor as he ran towards the window, slammed through it, and went crashing down on the concrete seven floors below. Complete madness. And then I saw the source of it all. On the floor, a couple of feet beyond the bed, writhed a tangled mess of tentacles. It was coated in blood and some sticky purple slime and it had the appearance of a fucking squid. Only its skull was a little fucked. Looked too human. I couldn't stare at it for long. My eyes seemed to slide off every time I tried to observe it for longer than a second, as if my body was rebelling against my commands, because those commands somehow went against everything evolution had ever taught it. Don't look. You'll die. It's too unnatural. But I couldn't just look away. I had to see. I had to know what the fuck had come out of my body. After a couple of agonizingly long moments, the monstrosity chose to end my suffering by scuttling out of the room, the suction cups on its feet, helping it move like some impossible crab. A shocking silence descended on the room after the thing had left. No one was screaming, everyone else was dead. I could hear my hoarse breath as I came to a terrifying realization. I had just given birth to a baby fucking eldritch monster, from my fucking balls. And it was a violent birth, one that had destroyed my cock and balls. I cried. For the beautiful appendages I had lost, for the doctors who had died, for the pain I had gone through, and most fucked up of all, for the baby I didn't even get to hold in my arms. The maternal instinct within me frightened me something awful. I just hoped that the government officials who would come to cover all this shit up would have some answers. I was so terribly disappointed to find out they didn't. They knew fucking nothing. I never found out what the thing was, how it got into my body, how it, or whatever created it chose me to be its father or mother, parent. All I know is that there is a terrible longing deep within me. I want my baby. I want to hold it in my arms, feed it, care for it, 
kiss it on its slimy little skull and sing lullabies to it. These feelings are going to be the death of me. Thank you for visiting Jack in the Box. Posted by Don't Worry About It. Chili Cheese Fries. Shut up. Chili Cheese Fries. Like three milkshakes. Shut the fuck up. You already ordered. I wrote it down before I pulled up. Now let me fucking order it. Nobody likes being the DD, and nothing makes the position of being a DD worse than when your load of drunken friends insists on going to Jack in the Box. When they finally calmed down, I rolled down my window to find that the woman on the other end was in the middle of a sentence. In the box, how may I help you? Hi, welcome to Jack in the Box. How may I help you? It wasn't enough to make me suspicious in the moment. She was probably just a tired employee who didn't have the patience to watch the security footage to see when my window would roll down and instead decided to repeat the opening line over and over again. Yeah, can I get a dash? Hi, welcome to Jack Dash. That one threw me a little more. It was odd, but I just cut her off impatiently. Yes, hi. Oh, there was a moment of static. Can I get a... I ordered. No point in enumerating every last thing. It was a lot of greasy food for a lot of drunk college students. When I had finished, the response was simply, Is that all? The female voice was small and frail and sounded scared and slightly breathless. I paused. I was starting to get nervous. There were no other cars in the CVS parking lot. There weren't even any kids loitering around the July 11th, which was usually common at that time of night on a Friday. The lights were all functional though, and there were cars going by on Abbott Avenue right beyond the low lining of bushes at the edge of the lot. I tried to feel relieved. It was two in the morning and I was dealing with a timid, odd, night owl employee. Yeah. Come to the first window. This time the voice was much stronger. It was full-bodied and professional. It was shocking in a way that I didn't really understand. But I pulled forward just as my friend Sandra reached forward and twisted the volume of the electronic song playing off of Ethan's iPod. I sighed. When I stopped at the first window, I was greeted by a charming, blonde face. She smiled through the closed window before pulling it open briskly and announcing in that same confident voice. 23.45 dollar hun. I handed her my credit card and she took it, turning away from me to run it. I fell into the drunken interactions that were going on the car for a moment, asking Ethan to see if Sean was still breathing, telling Taylor to stop singing loudly and crudely. I forgot all about the window for a long moment before I realized that I was probably being rude. When I turned back, the woman was still turned around. When she turned back, her skin had gone ghostly white. She was visibly shaking and her teeth seemed to be chattering. She was scratching something just behind her right ear, out of my view, vigorously. Her huge blue eyes were open wide, communicating what I can best describe with shock. Despite the fact that she was shaking though, when she brought her arm up, it was steady. She handed me my credit card and receipt, leaning forward to do it. Her face was closer to mine than a fast food cashier's ever had been, and when she smiled, I recoiled. It was sudden, mechanical, and without a doubt the falsest smile I have ever seen. It looked like her mouth had simply been stretched to give the illusion of a smile. She spoke in that tiny, scared voice. Drive through to the second window, please. I had to say something at that moment. Are you okay? She leaned back into the restaurant, still wearing that smile, and closed the window. But she didn't stop staring at me. The shaking subsided. The smile did not. The second window was also closed. I pulled out my phone and checked Facebook, trying to get my mind off of the noise in the car. I was used to Jack in the Box taking like two minutes, and when three went by, I started to wonder. 
When Seven went by, Ethan got out of the car and walked over to the window, knocking on it and screaming for food. When she finally came to the window, I got out of the car and pulled Ethan away from the window. When I realized it was the same woman, I froze for a moment. It was never the same woman. Either it was two different people, or they just closed the first window. It was an inefficient way to run a fast food place, and it just wasn't done. Ethan wandered back into the car as she opened the window. She stuck out two bags and I took them. She wasn't shaking anymore. She looked calm except for her vacant expression. She was looking right through me. Are you okay, ma'am? I noticed at that moment that I couldn't hear any sound coming from inside the restaurant. You can always hear the clanging of the kitchen no matter when you visit Jack in the Box, but all I heard was the rumbling of my idling engine. Suddenly the woman's eyes snapped to mine, and once again they got big, despite the fact that her expression remained composed. Her upper lip trembled for a moment. Just then I saw headlights in my rearview mirror pull into the drive through When I looked back the woman was staring intently at the headlights before her head snapped right back to me. She scratched behind her ear again and I noticed for the first time that her thumbnail was missing. There was nothing but blackened, rotting nail bed. And then she dropped her hand and her expression molded into one of courtesy and service. She smiled that same dead smile. Thank you for visiting Jack in the Box. She slammed the window shut. My friends ate everything in the car, moaning with pleasure with every ketchup-covered fry and jalapeno popper. When we got home, everyone managed to stumble inside, Ethan carrying the last bag, eating the occasional stray fry out of the bottom. I went to bed without so much as a word. The next morning, I noticed that Ethan had dropped the bag in the hallway. I begrudgingly picked it up and was about to throw it in the trash can when the receipt fell out, along with a few ketchup packets. I hadn't read it, who does? I had just shoved it in the bag, but when I picked it up I realized that three words had been scrawled on the back in a barely legible, shaking scrawl. Don't eat it. What does the dinosaur say? Posted by Old Doc Hudson May 17th of 2011 was my finals week. I was quietly working on a study guide in the Earth Sciences Department. Being surrounded by the fossils somehow made me feel less stressed about finals. Many of them were simply beautiful, with their natural curves set in stone. All of them, from ammonite shells to mammoth teeth, were arranged in a chronological fashion, from oldest to the youngest. On the middle display shelf were the Mesozoic era fossils, which held the dinosaur remains. Each was in exquisite detail, and I could hear them speak to me about the rich knowledge they contained. I could easily identify each of the specimens and what kind of dinosaur they were. Sitting there in the lounge next to the displays, I could easily get lost in the sweet music created by the ancient bones. I was getting distracted. So reluctantly, I returned to my studies. A couple of hours later, I had finished the assignment. However, I remained there for a little longer to hear the old fossils speak. They told me of their lives, from the massive migrations to the perilous hunts. The voices told me in graphic detail about the battles between predator and prey, fights for breeding rights, the nurturing care of the young, and so much more. In the center of this display, and by far the most extraordinary fossil here was that of a complete, unaltered velociraptor skull. As I got up to leave the musing session with the old bones, the hollows of the skull stared into me, like an old friend who wanted you to stay a while longer. Out loud I said, no worries, my friend, I will be back tomorrow. I proceeded to leave the building to head back to my apartment. In the dark and humid night, it was almost unbearable to walk across the campus. The summer heat had not yet quelled itself. Then I came across a horrible sight. 
Surrounding a large bonfire were several fraternities and sororities, celebrating the end of the semester. Many of them were intoxicated and mad with lust. I powered my way around the crowd, hoping to put as much distance between the manic group and myself in the shortest amount of time as possible. My path was blocked, however. A large and overbearing figure stood there, chanting in a sloppy, woo, yeah. I stopped and analyzed the drunk. I made no reply to his overzealous remark and simply walked around him. The next obstacle was harder to get around. A group of the football cheerleaders were handing out school spirit ribbons and other cultish objects to the students that passed by. Once I came into view, they immediately locked on to my presence. Do you have school spirit? The siren screamed at me. I was frightened by her suddenness and, in anger, replied, No, apparently this was the wrong answer. They surrounded me, trying to encourage their pathetic notion of brainwashing me. I just stood there in silence as they continued their banter. Fortunately, a friend came up and pulled me away from the scene. This friend's name was Roxanne. She was a physics major and the only human friend I had there. Leave him alone, you fucking sluts, she roared as she gently took my arm to take me away from them. The entire experience left me quite shaky. I don't do well in crowds and, fortunately, Roxanne knew this. I'm glad I ran into you, but I'm puzzled as to why you were there, Roxanne, I said quietly as we headed into the darkness. I was on my way back from the library when I saw them assaulting you, she said smugly. True to form, Roxanne was a very confident person. As if to reinforce her fierceness, she had medium red hair and green eyes. However, I couldn't help but find it adorable and attractive. Yet, I was too afraid to say such things to her. We continued our walk to the apartments. Our discussion shifted to post-finals plans. Neither she nor I had any plans to go home or to do anything special. Wanna hang out this weekend? Roxanne asked me. Thanks to the faint light provided by a street light, I could tell she had a slight blush. Struggling to agree, I said, yes, weekly. We parted ways to our separate apartments. I underwent my nightly rituals of preparing for bed. I am very strict on how I go about this. I begin with a 15-minute shower, followed by shaving, brushing my teeth, and lastly, I turn in. Tonight was different. I don't like different things. As I laid down, I heard a bone-chilling scream from outside. Jumping from my bed, I grabbed my keys and phone in a rush to investigate. Luckily, I live on the ground floor of the building and it didn't take me long to find the source of the scream. There on the ground, I found Roxanne unconscious in a small pool of blood. I called 911 and tried to stop the bleeding. 20 minutes later, the paramedics arrived and the head RA came out to examine the situation. Even a few hours later, I was too upset to sleep. I answered all of the questions I could and there were no clues at the crime scene. My mind was racing and I needed comfort. I returned to the Earth Science Department lounge in the hopes that the fossil voices would allow me to clear my mind. Being a paleontology major, I had a key card to access the building after hours. Once inside, I went straight to the lounge and took a seat. The voices were quiet. They said nothing to me. I got up and stared into the display case. My eyes became fixed onto the velociraptor skull. After what seemed to be a long silence, I heard the skull cry out. You, it said to me. I jumped upon hearing this. Remove me from this case, demanded the skull. I did as I was told and removed the skull from its perch. With gentle hands, I picked up the fragile skull and stared into the hollows of its eyes. A magnetic force drew me in. An intense hunger overtook me. I placed the skull back in its proper place and sat back down. The hunger became increasingly painful. I grabbed my stomach and cried out. In the heat of the moment, I blacked out. 
I regained consciousness, but it was very surreal. I was in the middle of the woods outside the apartment complex. The air was cool and a fresh mist made it seem to be quite peaceful, adding to the comfort of laying on the moss-laden ground. When I rose, I found that my clothes were ripped to shreds, my glasses were missing, and my hands and feet were covered in congealed, dried blood. In a small, clear puddle nearby allowed me to examine my reflection. There was dark red blood around my mouth and cheeks. Rather than being horrified, I just stood up and decided to return to my apartment to clean myself up. It was early in the morning. The golden orange sky illuminated my surroundings. There was not a soul to be seen on the campus grounds. However, stretched out across where the bonfire was being held was varying length of police tape. As I passed by, I started to remember what had happened last night. It was like an odd dream. I was on the hunt in a prehistoric forest. I had quietly stalked a group of five small, herbivorous dinosaurs into a clearing. Each of the morsels were chattering away with chirps and birdsong. In the shadows, I watched them intensely, followed their every move until they went quiet. My heart was pounding. My breathing became heavy. My mind was racing. In a superhuman leap, I jumped the largest herd member with a tremendous crash, sticking my sickle claws deep into its flesh. I continued to deliver kicks into the animal's backside. The creature fell on the spot in shock. I turned around dashed after the others, in a fury that would have scared gods. The herbivores tired quickly, making them easier to pick off. I bit one's neck and ripped out my throat. Another, I disemboweled with my hands and slashed its innards into a bloody mess. The last two ran in terror. My hunger was satisfied. I went inside my apartment and took a quick shower. After getting ready, I went off to the hospital to check on Roxanne. On the way there, I continued going over what I remembered from last night. I couldn't dismiss the event as a dream considering my hands were blood-soaked. To any normal person, I'm sure, this would have been a horrific experience and they would surely feel guilt-ridden. Not me. I felt it was completely natural and a newly found sense of pride engulfed me. Upon entering the hospital, I saw two of the annoying cheerleaders from last night in straight jackets. They were screaming in a panic that a dinosaur was out to murder them. The orderlies were trying to sedate them as I approached. They flinched in terror at the sight of me and silently fell into a deep sleep. I left them to their nightmares with a small laugh and entered Roxanne's room. Fortunately, she pulled through and was happy to see me. I sat next to her bedside and took her hand. I told her about my unusual dream. She just smiled and looked back at me. Let's go get something to eat after I get out of here. I agreed with her. It seems we have a mutual feeling of primeval hunger. After all, raptors hunt in packs.